here. So first of all, let me let me just say thank you to um, Senator Rosen and Governor Sisson for joining us here today, and all of our incredible speakers and the opportunity um, to be here at First Person Care Clinic as well to highlight the importance of bringing healthcare to people in our communities. Uh, you know the the idea that healthcare should be accessible and affordable for all of us is an important. Uh, concept and it's something that is worth fighting for. Um, let me just say this, um, together as you see we are speaking out on behalf of thousands of Nevadans um, that have gained access to quality affordable health care <coughs> thanks to the Affordable Care Act. <coughs> we are here to condemn the decision of this administration to continue their attempts to sabotage and repeal the Affordable Care Act. Access to affordable quality health care is the number one issue I hear from Nevadans every time I'm home, everywhere I go, I don't care if it's an urban, rural area, this is the number one issue. And many are, are rightly concerned about this administration's continued assault on, on this coverage. Um, I saw it when I first got to the Senate that first week, this idea that somehow they were going to repeal it and replace it and take it away from millions of Americans. Because that did not succeed, they have continued systematically to savage the Affordable Care Act and dismantle it. Again, harming so many people across this country. However, we're here also to highlight uh, another thing that is happening, and uh, we want to make sure people in our communities know this. Um, in just in the past few weeks, um, the Department of Justice and President Trump have signed on in support of a lawsuit that rips away health care protections enjoyed by hundreds uh, of millions uh, of Americans. If this lawsuit is successful, women could no longer receive access to pre preventative care services. Young adults under 26 could be kicked off their parents' insurance plans, and thousands of Nevada's families that got covered under the Medicaid expansion that we did here in the state of Nevada could see their health care taken away. Taken away. In Nevada, 1.2 million Nevadans uh, have pre-existing conditions. If the administration and the Republicans are successful with this lawsuit, that coverage will no longer exist. It, it is outrageous to me the continued assault on the health care in this country and uh, that this administration wants to do and harm uh, not only Nevada, but so many Americans. Um, the other thing that people don't realize, and there's so many incredible seniors living in our community, but uh, if, if the president is, is successful with this challenge in, in the, uh, to the Affordable Care Act, Nevada seniors would be charged more for their care. Rural hospitals and community health centers uh, could lose vital funding, and our mental health and addiction treatment services would be gutted. Nevadans over and over again have made it clear that they do not want to roll the clock backwards on their health, health yet that's what this administration under President Trump and the Republicans continue to want to do. This week, President Trump <coughs> promised that the Republicans were working on a truly great health plan. And he suggested that a Republican-controlled Congress could pass such a plan after the 2020 election. Well, let me just tell you who was in control of Congress the last two years and what they tried to do, which was to repeal and take away without any plan. So don't be fooled. Do not be fooled by their rhetoric. Look at their actions and what this administration continues to do. And with your help, we need to continue to highlight this and talk about the importance for everyone in, in our community. Healthcare for all of us. Access to affordable healthcare for all of us, no matter where you live. That is the fight that is on. That's what we stand for. That's what you see us here today talking about. And we need your help to make sure that that message gets out and the fight is on. The fight is on. So I thank you for joining us today, and it is my privilege and honor to um, be able to be here with you and um, introduce uh, the governor of our great state, Governor Cicely. Thank you all very much for being here today. I want to thank my good friends, both Senator Cortez Masto and Senator Rosen, for joining me and being such true champions of Nevada's health care in the United States Senate. I'd also like to thank the other speakers that you're going to hear from. Uh, they're very courageous to tell their personal stories that you're going to hear it and how it's affected them. President Trump's relentless attempts to sabotage our health care system have reached a new level. Uh, 
And under my administration, we're gonna fight this at every single turn that we encounter. Let me be crystal clear. If the ACA were completely dismantled, it would have a disastrous and sweeping consequences for the state of Nevada's entire healthcare system and leave hundreds of thousands of Nevadans hanging out to dry with no coverage. Nearly all sectors of our population would feel immediate devastating impacts. As the Senator said, those with pre-existing conditions, young adults, low-income Nevadans, covered under the Medicaid expansion, and more. Here in Nevada, we have 1.2 million residents, 1.2 million residents with a pre-existing condition. Folks who could have their health care coverage ripped away and face astronomical health care costs that they can't afford if the Affordable Care Act is overturned. Additionally, there are 211,000 more Nevadans that have health care coverage now thanks to Medicaid expansion, which hangs in the balance under the Trump administration's new position. That includes 13,000 Nevada children and nearly 60,000 low-income parents with dependent children. Under my predecessor, former Governor Brian Sandoval, Nevada became the first state with a Republican governor to do the right thing and expand Medicare coverage, Medicaid coverage. I am committed to continuing to do everything in our power to continue that coverage and protect that coverage. So within my first month of office, we worked with our new Attorney General, Aaron Ford, to intervene, intervene in Texas versus United States and defend the ACA from partisan attacks and protect the health care coverage of Nevada citizens. I will continue working with our Attorney General to exercise all legal options available to us to protect our citizens. In addition to defending the ACA in the courts, Nevada is leading on state level efforts to protect health care coverage for those with pre-existing conditions, regardless of what happens in Washington, D.C. State Senator Julia Ratty, herself a cancer survivor, has introduced a bill that would codify the ACA provisions for people with pre-existing conditions into Nevada law, a bill that I look forward with great anticipation to signing. When I was campaigning last year for governor, we went to all corners of the state. They wanted a governor who would stand up and fight for their coverage for pre-existing conditions. This is a theme we heard on a daily basis during our campaign. As long as I am governor of the great state of Nevada, I will continue to fight against radical and dangerous attempts to rip away this health care coverage from millions of Americans and throw our health care system into total chaos. Thank you for being here with us today and listening. Uh, and with that, I would like to introduce my good friend, the United States Senator, Jackie Rosen. So, of course, I want to give a special thanks to uh, Governor Sisolak, my dear friend, uh, Senator Cortez Masto, for really putting this event together today. Now, a little over a week ago, the Trump administration made yet another move to take away health care coverage and critical protections <coughs> from millions by instructing its own Justice Department to refuse to defend the Affordable Care Act in court. This past week, I stood with my colleagues on the steps of the Supreme Court to call out the Department of Justice and be sure that they reverse their course on this disastrous uh, decision. And I'm standing here to say this, enough is enough. The latest attempt to strip health care will hurt thousands of Nevadans, many of whom have gained access to quality, affordable health care under the ACA. And if this administration gets its way, Nevada's hardworking families <coughs> will suffer. They will suffer the consequences. We're no longer just talking about stripping away protections for those with pre-existing conditions, as if that wasn't enough. We're in much more dangerous territory than before. If our health care law is completely wiped out, we'll see an end to the tax credits that make coverage affordable for middle-class families. We'll see an end to preventative care provided without a copay, like health screenings and contraceptives. We'll see an end to the ability for young adults under the age of 26 to stay on their parents' insurance. And we'll see an end to the Medicaid expansion, which has helped over 200,000 Nevadans get coverage. And finally, we're standing here at First Care, 
a community health center that has helped serve over 20,000 patients here in Nevada for the last five years, thanks to the ACA. If the administration has its way with invalidating our health care law, it would spell disaster for these local primary care providers. Like Senator Masto said, the governor said, health care is one of the top kitchen table issues in Nevada. From Las Vegas to Elko, I've met with countless Nevadans who will be affected by this disastrous decision. And they tell me what it would mean to them and their families, their personal stories. Like it was stated, over 1.2 million Nevadans live with pre-existing conditions. 150,000 of those are children. And we all know what's at stake if these individuals are denied access to care. President Trump does everything he can to cut this. He cuts the open enrollment period. He slashes funding for public awareness. He makes endless unsuccessful attempts to repeal, repeal, repeal with no replacement. There is no Republican replacement plan, let's be clear. There's no Republican replacement plan that preserves protections for pre-existing conditions and ensures that everyone who has gained coverage will have the same options as under the ACA. So there are plenty of ways that we can work together to stabilize our healthcare markets, to bring down prescription drug crap prices, to create a public health, health option, to repeal the medical device tax, to find a solution to our physician shortage here in Nevada. And let's remember this about pre-existing conditions. Each and every one of us are one diagnosis away from being part of that pre-existing condition group. And so that's what's at stake here. And so we're here today to thank and be grateful for the people who work at this clinic and to hear some of the personal stories that they hear. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Senator Mastin to um, introduce some of our next speakers. Thank you. So often you hear uh, back in Washington, you see figures, you see graphs, but this is real life. This has an impact on the people across this country, and that's why we are here, to talk about the faces, uh, the families, the individuals that are working hard to bring health care um, to so many in need in our communities. And so I am uh, honored to uh, introduce and welcome Roxana Bailatone, who is the CEO of First Person Care, um, who will tell us about this incredible uh, facility we're in today and the importance of the Affordable Care Act and, and how um, by having access to health care as it brings that dignity to so many people uh, in our community. Thank you, Roxana. So we see patients regardless if they can afford to pay or not. It's not a free clinic, but we have a sliding scale. And depending how much they earn is how much they have to pay with nominal, nominal fees as low as $20. And in <coughs> our patients, they don't have the $20 we see them regardless. So this is huge. We have a pharmacy program uh, which allow us to uh, pass our savings to our clients. So a medication that might cost $200 in Walmart can cost $25 in our clinics. So we don't have money to pay for marketing, but this is something that we need to tell everyone, our friends and family, because um, people don't know that we are here. And we have eight community health centers in our state, and we have many sites around the valley and even in the north. Uh, um, we have in Reno, we have La Fair, everywhere. We are everywhere, and we want to grow. That's why we are applying for new access points in our state because in other states they have plenty of them. So um, today we're discussing uh, how can we make the affordable care uh, affordable, not um, free. And this is not about who put it together, if it's Republican or Democrat. This is about health. And health is something that impacts every single person in the United States. And uh, we have to, um, how can we, you know, make it work? Like I said, this is not a competition about uh, who, who came out with the best program. 
that is uh, why it's so hard. That is why it's so hard to put together something unique because it affects everyone. And uh, we have, uh, in our experience, our patients, we hear that the young adults they always complain because they have to pay uh, and they don't go to the doctor that often. So I believe that it might help if we can give credit so for those people to that respect their health. They're the small, they go to the gym, they should have some credit. That way when they have to pay the following year, you know, they see that someone is paying attention that they care about the health. And uh, those who has no choice, that get sick regardless if they try to be healthy, um, then we have to come up with a solution. Let's say our Medicare patients, uh, they, they don't work. And they, have to, they still have to pay like $127 or more every month and they don't work. So our working class, our young adults, shouldn't be complaining of paying some money uh, because they can work. So that money, if they don't have to pay because we have patients that pays only $12 for with the affordable care app, which is great. But if they pay a little bit more, like our Medicare uh, patients, that money can be used for those medications that, so for those patients that they, you know, they have maybe cancer, those kids that they have cancer, you know, they didn't do anything to get that disease, that horrible disease. So there's a, uh, a lot of things that we can talk about, and I know today is not the day, but um, we are, you know, we can help the senators and the um, people, the um, governor and people in our, um, you know, all the our representatives, our representatives to and share our stories to see if we can make it better because we have real stories. Um, you know, we all, uh, that we can get sick and we really care because our kids and our grandpas and you know all those people that are out there that we really care about then we should um, do something about it and and don't be that selfish so thank you so much for being here today and uh, you can visit our website for more information about our services and again thank you Uh, next, I'd like to invite uh, 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 Rachel Asiota. She was a uh, Rachel was a student at UNLV. Um, it, pardon? CSN. I'm sorry, CSN. Oh my goodness, thank you, CSN. Uh, to share, great school. To, yeah, it is. They're all great schools. They are, of course. Yeah. But thank you, thank you for being here and sharing your story about how the Affordable Care Act is impacting us. Rachel Sierra, and I'm a student here in Las Vegas. After a few years and quite a bit of push between me and my OBGYN and myself, uh, my doctor finally agreed to see why I was in such pain. That's when I was diagnosed with endometriosis at the age of 19. Before this diagnosis, my doctor did not believe what I was talking about when I was telling her what I went through each month. She told me that she did not have a magic wand to make everything better and that I should just have sucked it up. The pain was debilitating, and to add to it, I was also diagnosed with fibromyalgia a few years after. I'm only 27 years old, and I have two illnesses that would have prevented me from being insured only 11 years ago. Three years ago, however, I was able to get an IUD, and thanks to the ACA, I was able to get that IUD without a copay, which could have been as much as $1,000. The IUD changed my life, and between the IUD and my other medications for fibromyalgia, they have made my day-to-day -day manageable. If it wasn't for the ACA's protection and for those with pre-existing conditions like myself, the no copay IUD and the extended age cap remaining under my mother's insurance, I don't know where I would be today because of my pain. I have my life back and I cannot imagine a world where I would have to suffer in silence. I am proud that Nevada has such champions that care about our health care. Senators Captain Cortez Masto and those who continue to fight for quality, affordable care protecting individuals from things they cannot control. I would especially like to thank Governor Sisolak because he can help us here at home in Nevada as folks try to rip away our health care protections. Thank you for inviting me to speak today, for hearing their stories, and for being champions for a quality, affordable health care. Uh, and so, 
Of course, uh, I want to introduce you as well to uh, Max Maxwell. Max is a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps, and he's going to also talk about the impact that the Affordable Care Act has had. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've been, uh, myself and my wife have been advocates here at First Person, patient advocates, for quite some time. Uh, my wife would have been here today, except uh, she received her weekly uh, intravenous gamma globulin infusion just on Wednesday, and she is still dealing with the headaches and flu symptoms that comes with that type of infusion. Yeah. I got out of the U.S. Marines in the late 80s and moved to Las Vegas. My first wife, Patty, and I were struggling to make ends meet. Like so many other American households, we didn't qualify for any social programs. We were the classic working poor. Patty had been diagnosed earlier with high blood pressure and heart disease. We weren't able to afford the blood pressure medicine prescribed for her. On May 19, 1994, my first wife, Patty, died from a cerebral hemorrhage due to treatable high blood pressure, less than one month before our first anniversary. My first wife may have survived for many more years with access to the right medication. My life went on from that tragedy, and many years later, I met my second wife. Janice went back to UNLV during the economic slump in Vegas to finish her degree in history and poli sci. She somehow managed to contract an incredibly rare disease called guillain barre syndrome. The lifelong version of she has now is called chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. She spent almost three months in rehab learning to walk again. The greatest day in most people's lives are when they graduate boot camp, get married, or have a baby. The greatest day in our lives is when I saw my wife walk again for the first time. Without the incredibly expensive medicine and the care she gets at first person, our FQHC, her autoimmune disease would start attacking her body again. Then within about three months, she'd lose the ability to walk and probably eventually lose the ability to breathe soon after that. It is an absolute necessity for all Americans to have access to health care where they can't be denied for pre-existing conditions. And everyone should have access to medicine they can afford. Sadly, there are far too many diseases like cancer and a number of others with government cutbacks or new insurance loopholes can literally be a death sentence to the patients. We're dying out here. It isn't a political catchphrase or a game. We need a strong leadership in Washington on both sides of the aisle to not only protect patients with pre-existing conditions, but to find ways to make medicines affordable and accessible to all Americans. We need Congress to work together on behalf of all the people and create a new health care plan. We hope you treat it like it's the most important piece of legislation you have ever worked on and come up with an incredible plan because it's literally life and death to millions of patients whose lives are in the balance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Clearly, uh, we are all here because we are passionate about this issue and the importance uh, to ensure that everybody in this country, all of us, everyone, uh, has access to health care. Health care for all of us. That's not a crazy concept. Right? Uh, and so um, I want to thank all of you for being here. Thank you for your stories. It, it, it is the stories that really resonate back in Washington because it's the faces of the people uh, across this country who are being challenged right now with this administration's policy to uh, rip away health care uh, for millions of Americans. Let me do this. Let me open this up to questions. Does anybody have any questions? I just want to thank you, the leaders, uh, Senator and Governor, Senators and Governor, for your work and speaking out on the importance of protecting the Affordable Care Act. I also want to commend the First Person Care Clinic. This is a great example of um, accessible health care for people who <coughs> live in Nevada. Uh, we have only 35 clinics like this across our state. Um, our state compares the population to another state, Arkansas, that has 120 of them right now, and to Mississippi, which has 200. And we also are um, undernumbered uh, in these kinds of healthcare clinics with the states around us as well. So 
I want I want to know what can you do when you go back, not only to protect the Affordable Care Act, but as you go back to Washington, <coughs> what can the two of you do to make sure that we get our share here in Nevada of funding for clinics like this one? And also, um, can you work to change the funding cycle so that it's not two years, but five years instead? So that uh, organizations like this particular clinic can plan ahead uh, beyond the two-year time period. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So let me, Jackie and I can speak from the federal perspective, and okay. the governor wants to speak from the state perspective, absolutely. Um, a couple of things. I think it's important for us to incentivize uh, more clinics to be open, and that means that we have to make sure the laws are flexible to allow that, uh, and that the federal dollars are available and they're coming into the community. So that's what Jackie and I fight for uh, every single day. Uh, in my office, not only do I have a grant team that works with the, the, the um, clinics of so many people across this country to identify the funding, uh, help them with the technical expertise and what they need to make sure that they are on the front lines of, of receiving it. Um, we will continue to do so. Um, and uh, I think it's important also absolutely what you said this two-year cycle versus five years I don't know of any business that can do keep their doors open and have some continuity continuity and planning if they can't plan for a five-year period down the road I think that's true for any small business or any business and, and that is our challenge um, to me I understand it and that's how some of this the funding at the federal level we should be looking at that uh, so that businesses can plan to keep their doors open and serve so many others and I think that that is something absolutely I look at every single day uh, in, 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 at the federal level. Well, I'm on the health, education, labor, and pensions. Podium, please. Pardon me? Please. Microphone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm on the health, education, labor, and pensions committee. So in my committee, uh, I should be able to uh, maybe bring forth some hearings. We've already had some hearings on the good work <coughs> that community health centers do, the federal, federally qualified health centers, expanding our teaching residencies out <coughs> to underserved communities, rural communities. So that would uh, really impact here, us here in Nevada. So those are some of the things that I can do on that committee. I do agree with Catherine, no matter what committee we're on, these short-term funding cycles, these continuing resolutions, whatever area of government you're in, it's costing us more money because we can only do short-term planning and we're falling short on many of our goals because we can't predict and plan into the future. Our staffing needs, equipment, whatever those things are. So some of the things we have to fight for in the budgeting process and in the authorization process is to be sure that they're for longer periods that make more sense. So that's what I'm gonna be working on. Um, and we also do in our uh, official office have a grants person. And so we're uh, working together with Senator Masto's office and of course with the governor here in the state to be sure we identify uh, each and every opportunity we have to obtain a grant or if other states are doing it, how do we get it here to our state? So that's what we're doing. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Senator. And it's a great question and I appreciate it. On the state level, I can tell you our two priorities are both education and healthcare. That's what we heard for a year and a half campaigning. Uh, as it relates to healthcare, we've put more money into women's health issues than have ever been put in before. We've increased to an all-time high the level of money we put into mental health. And it's bad in the urban communities, but the healthcare is worse in the rurals. We've had allocated more money. We've allocated money to provide more veterans representatives so we can access some of these federal dollars as it relates to healthcare. So we are turning over every rock and using every penny we can find in order to fund healthcare more adequately. And there's a long way to go, but we're making progress. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, let's go right in. I want to say thank you for all the work that you're doing, and I have stories for each and every angle. I'm a pediatric nurse here in Las Vegas. I also do pediatric oncology, so I had a question specifically about the life plan cap for our goals. The removal of goals are most currently in jeopardy because I personally have seen a three-year-old by leukemia that hit that maximum with the expensive chemotherapy drugs, and when that was enacted, I had kids, you know, I saw children previously, we're not going to be able to get insurance coverage for the rest of their life, both for a pre-existing condition and for maxing out when they were three years old. So is that in jeopardy and is that being protected? Are you guys fighting to protect that as well? Well, I can um, tell you, um, when I was in the House of Representatives, I was proud to lead the resolution that um, defended the essential health benefits in the ACA. We had, I believe, nearly 190 people sign on to that. Of course, it didn't pass in the House 
did pass this time in the Democratic House. Senator Manchin was kind enough, he led that in the Senate, and that was one of the first things that we did. And so, lifetime caps, pre-existing conditions and lifetime caps go hand in hand. Because if you have a chronic disease, what that means is, you're, depending on your age, you're gonna live with it for the rest of your life. So maybe if you're 100, that rest of your life might be shorter, but if you're three years old, you hopefully have a long way. And so it is really important that we talk about those 10 essential health benefits, that being a woman isn't a pre-existing condition, that preventative care, if your parents tell you that old adage, an ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure, it would have saved your life. And so those 10 essential health benefits were in there for common sense reasons, and that's what we're doing. Uh, let me here, and then we'll go back there. Um, following up on, on the first question, if um, either the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court ultimately upholds the Affordable Care Act as is, what, um, what do you see as possible in terms of you know, what, what you can do, what else you can do to improve on the law, build on the law, you know, bring, bring costs down for consumers and or expand coverage further? Yeah, we, we already have legislation to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, that has been the fight, uh, I think, in the clear distinction between, uh, unfortunately, uh, the Democrats and Republicans. And I'm not saying all Republicans. I'm saying just the leadership right now. Um, there are, I know there's bipartisan work that can be done to shore up the Affordable Care Act. We already have the legislation out there. We need to address a number of things. We need to make sure that there's more flexibility in waivers. We need to look at the insurance. We need to make sure that those businesses that uh, are trying to make sure that they have health care, the small businesses can have affordable health care for their employees. We need to make sure that there are individuals right now who, uh, who literally are the working poor, make too much money to be able to afford uh, some of the, get some of the subsidies for the Affordable Care Act, but not enough to be able to afford to have health insurance in the country. We need to address that gap. The legislation's already there. It's already been introduced. The Democrats have introduced it. Our goal has been uh, to really say, listen, this is the foundation of the Affordable Care Act. Was it perfect? No. But it's a foundation that's starting for, for us to improve it, to make sure we can bring in more people to give them access to affordable health care in this country. That, to me, is, is a reasonable conversation mm -hmm. to move forward and worth, worth fighting for. And that's where we're looking for the bipartisan support. And if I could just add, on the state level, uh, we're working particularly with Senator Ratty and Senator Kazawa with uh, transparency as it relates to drug pricing mm -hmm. and to bring some of these pharmaceuticals into line. Uh, the cost of prescription drugs has become astronomical. People are facing <clears throat> it on a daily and a weekly basis. And uh, we've all said it, it's not a sound bite. You shouldn't have to choose between buying food and paying for your prescription. So we're making inroads and hopefully uh, we've got a chance this session to make some uh, big changes as it relates to transparency and prescription drug prices. Yeah. So in the back. Uh, Senator, uh, two questions, one for you and for, one for the governor, so I'll just ask one at a time. Uh, with the House having flipped, if the administration is waiting till, until 2020 to try to tackle health care again, going the route of instructing the DOJ as they have in this case, do you expect that to be the status quo for the next 18 months or so, uh, uh, trying to dismantle piece by piece the ACA? Oh, I don't think they're going to stop. I, I honestly do not think that they are going to stop. They failed to, uh, two years ago, the first week uh, when I got there, and they've been systematically sabotaging it and dismantling it. Their goal is to take it away however they can. Uh, that's not gonna stop until we get leadership there that's willing to recognize that it, it's not about taking away and harming individuals, it's about bringing more people in. It's about healthcare for all of us and actually affordable healthcare for all of us. That's the fight right now and that's why it's important that so many people across this country stand up and come out. Let, let me just say this, um, this fight on health care is really a number one issue that I, when, I when, when people realize that they're going to be impacted by this, it, the calls into the, to our offices, the phone, the emails, the letters, the people that should come up to our offices, whether it's in D.C. or here, this is the one thing that crosses all boundaries because it should.